Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to INTAC's webinar, SOAR for Children, Connecting Children and Youth with SSI Support. Um, my name is Nellie Sweeney, and I'm a TA specialist with INTAC. Um, FREDLA, the organization that I'm with, the Family Run Executive Director Leadership Association, is a core partner uh, in the National Training and Technical Assistance Center. We're glad you've joined us today. Please feel free to put your name and where you're from in the chat box so that we can see what type of audience we have today. A quick disclaimer, uh, this presentation was prepared for INTAC under a cooperative agreement with SAMHSA. And so all of the material that's in this presentation, um, except those that are obviously copyrighted, is public domain and can be reproduced or copied without permission from SAMHSA or the authors. Um, this is supported by SAMHSA. Um, and it's part of um, the National Training and Technical Assistance Center grant that we have. In the event that we have any type of security issues, um, the session is going to immediately end. Um, we have Joanne Bloom as our intact tech host today. She will end this and a separate email will be sent to all participants with further instructions, either another link or the possibility of rescheduling. Real quickly, I wanted to give you a brief INTECH overview if you're not familiar with us. Um, we are a National Training and Technical Assistance Center for Children, Youth, and Families, and we have a multi multidisciplinary team. You can see here all the different partners uh, that are involved in providing free technical assistance and training um, across the nation. Our goal is that all children, youth, young adults and families with emotional or behavioral health needs can access evidence-based treatment and recovery and resiliency services in a well-coordinated system of care. These are just examples of the different types of audiences um, that we serve, um, but it's definitely not an exhaustive list. We provide no-cost training, technical assistance, and resources, and some consultation. Um, you can see here on this wheel, we provide practical tools, podcasts. Um, we have a number of Five Things Digest on the website. We have communities of practice. We do customized coaching uh, for states and communities and system of care sites, individual consultation, and we have a number of peer learning exchanges. So today I am very pleased to welcome Kristen Lupfer. Uh, she is the project director at the SAMHSA SOAR PA Center. Um, and SOAR stands for SSI, SSDI, Outreach, Access and Recovery TA Center. Um, I know Kristen through her um, work with the SOAR TA Center being part of an expert panel um, and the work that is done by the TA Center um, is, is pretty amazing. Um, there, they have a number of uh, resources on the TA Center website, um, and Kristen is a co-author of a number of those things, including the online course. Um, they have a course in adult, and they also have a children's course in SOAR, um, with the idea of helping people get connected quickly. Um, to services and supports through Social Security. Um, so with that, I would like to turn it over to Kristen, um, and I look forward to uh, interacting with everyone in the chat box. Kristen, I'm going to stop sharing. All right, one second. All right, thank you so much, Millie. I'm really honored to be joining you all this afternoon. All right. So our purpose and objectives really for this call are to first define the importance of SSI benefits for children and youth with serious mental illness and their families who might be experiencing our risk of homelessness, including the income, health insurance, education and employment supports and housing stability that those benefits can bring. I want to explain the effectiveness of the SOAR model for expediting those decisions and improving approval rates for Social Security disability benefits. And finally, identify opportunities that you all can get involved with SOAR for children, including connecting to local SOAR efforts, the SOAR online course, and the SOAR online application tracking program, or OAT. All right. 
So I imagine that some of you are either currently involved with SOAR or at least a little familiar with the SOAR program. And I'm also sure we're welcoming some, of, welcoming some of you who are totally new to SOAR completely. So I'll start from the beginning for a quick review. Like Millie said, SOAR is a SAMHSA-sponsored program that focuses on increasing access to Social Security disability benefits for those individuals who are experiencing are at risk of homelessness, again, with those who have a serious mental illness, medical condition, or co-occurring substance use disorder. And SOAR for Adults is active in all 50 states in Washington, DC. Each state's at a different level of implementation. But SOAR for Children is still getting established and expanding in communities. And so I'm particularly excited about this partnership with NTAC to help connect children and youth with SSI support. So how did we come to this expansion of SOAR? The SOAR training and process was originally developed for adult SSI and SSDI applications in 2005. And we worked really hard for 10 years rolling SOAR out to all 50 states in Washington, DC. It took that long to get to every state. Um, and we were fielding questions at the time about SSI for children, but we didn't yet have an answer or a solution. So in 2014, we were able to issue a child SSI issue brief, just, you know, a 25 page document, which was a wonderful introductory resource for SOAR providers who wanted to better understand SSI for children. But it really was a temporary solution to the need for something more. So in September of 2017, we brought together experts from child welfare and Medicaid and systems of care and children's behavioral health and school systems and juvenile justice and youth and family organizations and more to really help shape the direction of our work and the creation of the SOAR online course child curriculum, um, which was launched in October of 2018. So it's been over three years now, and we still have lots of outreach and expansion to do. So we I told you it took us 10 years to get to every state with the adult curriculum. Now with the child curriculum, we are uh, just part way through and hoping that you will help us with that work. So as for the stats that are on the slide, so I'm sure you all know them well, and I'm not going to read them to you, but I just, we have this here and talk about it or remind ourselves um, that children and youth who are experiencing homelessness have higher rates of disability, experience higher rates of mental health problems, developmental delays, poorer cognitive outcomes, than their stably housed peers. And so we need SOAR for children. We want to build a foundation for recovery and resiliency, and we have to start with a strong brick of steady income. We also know that we need employment and education and health insurance to provide stabilizing bricks in that foundation. So income is just the beginning, and income maximization helps us build that strongest foundation. All right, so Social Security benefits and programs are complex. <laughs> there is a lot to learn, and so I'm just going to give you a taste. So we're all on the same page, and I leave you wanting a little bit more. So for those of you who might be familiar with SSI and SSDI for adults, listen closely, because there are special considerations and eligibility criteria for children. The Social Security Administration, or SSA, offers Supplemental Security Income, or SSI, for children birth up to age 18 attainment. The benefit is for children who are disabled or blind. And SSA wants to know, does the child have a medically determinable physical or mental impairment that's lasted or is expected to last 12 months or more or result in death? Um, and does the child have significant functional impairments as they compare to children of the same age who don't have physical or mental impairments? So it's a mouthful. Um, like with adults, this isn't a short-term or a partial disability program. Having a diagnosis is not enough. Having a chronic condition is not enough. The illness or the condition must be impacting the child's functional abilities. On the non-medical side, financial need for SSI is a complete picture of the child's income, their resources and living arrangement, as well as their family resources. The maximum federal benefit rate for um, SSI beneficiaries is $841 a month in 2022 and comes with Medicaid in most states. So we're focused on children and youth for today's presentation, but I want to make sure that you're all aware that SOAR can be used as a model to support any Social Security disability application for children, youth, and adults. And we have resources that are targeted to each of these unique populations that can help navigate the differences 
and the similarities between the programs um, and processes. And we'll dig into a little bit more of this. So focusing in briefly on youth and young adults, there are a few things that come into play for this age group. In terms of documenting the disability, there are some key sources of information that are really important when there's not an extensive work history that can demonstrate that difficulty in functioning. So school records, collateral source information from family and friends and service providers can be really essential. So SSA is looking at a comparison to an average youth in terms of their developmental and decision-making abilities. So a little bit of details for young adults who are eligible for SSI as a child. They'll be evaluated when they turn age 18 to determine if they qualify under the adult definition of disability. And like we've already learned this afternoon, as a child, disability is determined by marked or severe functional limitations as compared to children without a disability at the same age. So now as an adult, the youth's disability would be measured against their ability to perform substantial gainful activity. We'll get into that in a minute. And then finally, just a note for youth who are aging out of foster care, SSA has a policy that allows foster youth of any age to apply for SSI up to six months before they leave care. All right, so we've established that SSA defines disability for children as this medically determinable impairment, which causes marked and severe functional limitations. It's been expected to last for this continuous period. So the slide states it much more simply. They're basically, they're looking for a diagnosis, documentation of that diagnosis, a duration of at least a year, and that the diagnosis is impacting the child's functional abilities as compared to a child of the same age who doesn't have physical or mental impairments. So the age of the child at the time of application uh, definitely comes into consideration. So here's that uh, kind of determination step-by-step -step, or the sequential evaluation for children. So Social Security uses this as sequential evaluation um, that they take an application through. So they first look to see if the child is working at SGA or substantial gainful activity. So we know that most children won't be working, though I know many of you probably worked as youth. I was working at age 15. Um, but so some youth may have worked, some or may be working. Um, and so their current ability to earn income will be taken into consideration. So SGA this year is measured at earnings of $1,350 a month. So if a youth can earn that much, much, excuse me, they're not eligible for SSI. If they pass this first step, um, SSA looks to see if they have a severe impairment. So they use medical records and medical evidence to determine this. And if it doesn't appear severe, they can deny the application at this point. If it gets past that checkpoint, finally they look to see if the impairments meet or medically equal or functionally equal the listings. Um, and this is where it veers off a little from the adult disability determination process. So for children, they have an extra step about functionally equaling the listings. And we're not gonna get into the weeds today, but I'd love to <laughs> about the listings, um, but you can dig into them in the SOAR online course, learn more about it. But basically it's how SSI, SSA, excuse me, defines the level of disability in different body systems. So the listings are our guide for how to document the disability. So if you couldn't guess it from the slide, we think that SOAR caseworkers are superheroes. SOAR isn't easy. Uh, submitting high quality and complete social security disability applications is not a breeze. And yet we do the hard work because we know it works. And by studying our outcomes, we know that the use of the critical components of the SOAR model to fidelity means that applications are significantly more likely to be approved. Um, so we know what it takes to get it right. So by carefully tracking those outcomes, like I said, we know SOAR works and it's through community collaboration, partnerships with SSA, the disability determination services and medical providers. SOAR trained caseworkers around the country have been able to successfully assist over 50,000 people to get approved for benefits on their initial application. For unassisted applications from people experiencing homelessness, the average approval rate on initial application, only about 10 to 15%. And the national average for all applicants isn't much higher, only about 30.8%. So that means that most people are denied on their initial application. However, the national cumulative SOAR approval rate is over double that 
at 65%. SOAR decisions last year were made in an average of 155 days. Now those are pandemic impacted numbers, so they trend shorter in what I call the before times. Um, but even with the pandemic delays, there is no more waiting one or two years for an appeal. SOAR is really about getting it right that first time. Not only does SOAR make an impact on approval rates and time to decision, which means getting life-saving income and health insurance to people who need it faster, we also make an impact on our agencies and communities. So states that tracked general assistance reimbursement saw an average of $2,895 per approved application, coming back to them, an average of $38,000 of Medicaid reimbursement per beneficiary, so imagine that return on investment for a Medicaid funded agency who's investing caseworker time into assisting with applications. Um, the retroactive payments are life changing for families um, and we're bringing hundreds of millions of dollars into local economies as we help to stabilize lives, um, which is our mission. <clears throat> And while all of that is fantastic, there's more. Uh, we have 10 states that were able to achieve uh, even greater rates. So this 79% approval rate from our top 10 states represents 22,000 decisions in these states. So when we know, uh, excuse me, we know how to get it right and we can do it over and over again. So various states have been implementing SOAR with children and tracking their decisions in our OAT system. So for 658 decisions, these providers saw a 72% approval rate in an average of 114 days to decision. So we know that SOAR works for children too. This doesn't all happen in a vacuum. It requires a lot of community collaboration and we work hard to bring all of the relevant stakeholders to the table to make the systems work more smoothly. The bringing together of stakeholders happens through SOAR state team leads, SOAR local leads, and SOAR trained caseworkers who are assisting with applications. SOAR is a model for submitting these high quality social security disability applications, and it's also a systems change effort to help streamline these complicated bureaucratic systems and make sure that they're working for the people that they're meant to serve. So I already mentioned that high SOAR outcomes don't come easy. It does require time and effort to submit those quality complete applications. But the good news is that the SAMHSA SOAR TA Center provides support to states and communities to implement SOAR. Um, and like Millie said, this is all free, all provided by SAMHSA. We have liaisons who are responsible for SOAR in multiple states and who build relationships locally to really provide a personalized service. We provide assistance from strategic planning at the state level, developing funding plans and key collaborations with federal partners, down to helping caseworkers with question number 25 on the SSI application. So if it has something to do with social security disability applications, we wanna help make the process smoother, more timely and at a higher quality. So we offer what we call soaring over lunch calls, which is kind of like office hours uh, for new and seasoned caseworkers to get their questions answered. We celebrate success stories in our monthly newsletter. We train local and state leaders in our leadership academy and maintain a library just packed full of tools and resources for use by stakeholders at all levels. So like Millie mentioned, we offer two SOAR online courses, an adult curriculum and a child curriculum. Both courses are online, free, and available to take anytime, anywhere you've got an internet connection. We estimate it takes 20 hours to complete each course, including the practice case component. But successful completion comes with 20 free, again, CEUs uh, from the National Association of Social Workers. And we have SOAR leaders who are available to help coordinate follow-up training and support for individuals who are working on and who complete the courses. So here's a peek at the child curriculum. There are seven classes that cover you from SSI 101 um, to education and work incentives after approval and just about everything in between. We have customized worksheets and tools that really help to take the guesswork and frustration out of the process. Our online courses are unique in that they include practice cases complete with fictional medical records, progress notes, 
applicant interviews that are recorded with actors. Um, and participants get to practice completing an entire social security packet with um, forms and the signature SOAR medical summary report. Our staff review each packet and provide individualized feedback. So everyone who completes the SOAR online course has completed at least one social security application. So they can feel confident in knowing that when they use these, um, this information that they've learned from the course with a real applicant, they feel confident that they know what they're doing. All right, so many people ask us what it takes to get involved with SOAR. And like I mentioned, the training takes approximately 20 total hours. We then estimate that based on both anecdotal evidence and information that's reported in our outcome tracking system, that it can take about 20 to 40 hours to complete an application. And that's from start to finish, from the first time you engage with someone um, to receiving that decision letter. So having dedicated staff time to both learning and then implementing the model is a really important consideration that requires planning and supervisor commitment. So we have resources on the SOAR website that help to outline the importance of implementing the fidelity model and tracking those outcomes. But it really is worth the time investment, both to the um, a benefit to the individuals you serve, which is first and foremost. But again, like I mentioned, it also brings Medicaid reimbursement, funding opportunities, and mission fulfillment uh, to your agencies. So the uh, screenshot on this next slide, we developed this resource that helps to outline different intercepts in the SSI application process for children. We want child serving providers and others to see how they can be involved from identifying applicants, uh, providing records and documentation to assisting with the full application and the follow-up support that comes with it. So something we want you to think about kind of both now and later um, and think about as we kind of talk through more of this is how can you support your community in becoming involved in SOAR for Children? Or maybe it's your, your small community at your agency or, or what you're doing, but thinking about what that might be like. And we have some ideas for you. So um, identifying your children and youth counterparts, any existing stakeholders, getting contacts in all of the specialty areas that you might need. Um, you can organize a SOAR for Children orientation. The SOAR TA Center, including myself, we're available to you know, hold these introductory sessions for your agency, for your community, um, to provide more information, to provide um, answers to your questions. And as part of that, um, it can be really important to assess your current need and capacity. So how many children and families are experiencing our risk of homelessness in your community? How many might be eligible for or benefit from SSI benefits? Do you have anyone who is currently assisting with SSI applications for children? If you come across someone who needs to apply, is there anyone um, who's available to help? One of the things that we um, encourage you know, communities to do is to meet with SSA and DDS. Those are key federal partners to discuss the SOAR process for child SSI claims. And your current SOAR leads and TA Center liaison can really help with this effort. In a lot of places, these connections are made um, and you can be wrapped up into that effort. Um, and finally, and always, including youth and parents on your steering committee um, and in your planning as you do this work. So outreach is really important and people need to know that they, what they may be eligible for and service providers need to know what programs are available. So the SOAR TA Center developed six SSI for children fact sheets. And I have a screenshot of one of them on the screen up here. But um, the, we have six versions that are targeted to parents and caregivers, which you see here, uh, youth providers, the education system, child welfare, health and behavioral health providers, um, and family shelters and homeless service providers. And so each one provides you know, similar information, but tailored information based on um, the system that is, is targeting, that we are targeting for that outreach. These uh, fact sheets are available in both English and Spanish, uh, can be downloaded from our website, shared with uh, any relevant providers. All right, so I'm gonna talk uh, very briefly about tracking outcomes because it is absolutely, uh, excuse me, absolutely essential to the successful implementation and expansion of SOAR. 
So we provide a free web-based database uh, to track SOAR outcomes. It's called OAT. Uh, I think we've said before, online application tracking. It's really user-friendly. It's on a secure server. It's HIPAA compliant. Registration is easy. There are multiple user roles to help with agency, local, and state leaders uh, in order to facilitate kind of ease of reporting and review of that reporting. Here's just a peek at the caseworker dashboard. Um, this really helps to keep application outcomes organized. Again, it allows for that easy reporting and also helps with quality review and supervision. So we not only track the outcome of the application, but whether those SOAR critical components were used. And that's how we know by looking statistically at the data that the more critical components that are done, fidelity to the model uh, means a greater likelihood of approval. It only takes about three to five minutes to add the outcomes for each application. So it's not a time burden to the caseworker. Um, it's just a you know, quick final step when that decision comes in. So we wanna encourage you to gather more information about SOAR, consider incorporating SOAR for children into your services. Um, so if you visit the SOAR website, you go to SOAR in your state, you can find your state team lead, your SAMHSA SOAR TA Center liaison. Um, and check out our website and the child curriculum and reach out to us with any questions you may have or if you want to make a plan uh, for using SOAR. So linked here, and this will be available uh, to you later, are some additional resources uh, that you can check out, use for future reference as you want to explore all of this. And I'll also drop some um, other direct links uh, into the chat for some of these outreach materials I mentioned. So I, um, I know a <laughs> fast talker and sped through that information really quickly, but I wanted to make sure that we had plenty of time for discussion and your questions about what we covered today. So, you know, my questions to you are, what are you still wondering about? And then what can be your next step? What are you thinking about now? Feel free to drop those into the chat box. I think uh, Isamar has her hand up. Yeah, please go ahead. Thanks. Good afternoon. My name is Isamar um, and from Middlesex FSO, New Jersey. I do have a question. Um, is there a center in um, New Jersey or in Middlesex County for uh, referrals that we can you know refer families that are currently having challenges with requesting SSI, SSDI? Is there a SOAR center in New Jersey? Yeah, it's a great question. So we do have uh, SOAR trained providers in New Jersey. The majority of those providers serve adults. Um, so we're still working on this expansion into um, pro to have providers who are trained and able to assist with SSI for children. Um, but what I would say is the best next step is to reach out to the Sortier Center Liaison to New Jersey. Her name is Pam, Pam Hine. She's wonderful. She lives there too. Um, and I can put our directory link uh, directly in the chat. So anybody here from, you know, from any location, this is um, a great thing if you want to get connected to what's going on with SOAR in your state, what might be available um, to follow that um, link and find your contacts. Um, so let me just pull that. Awesome. That, that sounds great. And when we reach out to this um, individual, would we be able to make that referral and then they would follow up with the family for that application or what would that look like? Yeah, so it's not a direct referral source. So this liaison would be someone who works at the Technical Assistance Center with me and knows about providers locally in New Jersey. And so we'd be able to tell you if there are providers who are actively providing um, SOAR for children. Um, and then if there is someone who is trained and you know actively taking referrals, they could get you connected with them. And then they would be able to share their um, referral process. So. Great question. Um, just for clarification purposes, um, will someone be assisting filling out that application with the family or guiding them? So it, it depends on the agency, but the way that we train in the SOAR model that you are actively assisting through the process. So the trained caseworker, whether that's a 
a social worker, an outreach worker, anyone who might be kind of in that direct service role would serve as the appointed representative, which is just a formal role with Social Security where you can um, communicate with them on behalf of the applicant. And so our SOAR trained providers will help to complete all of the applications. They'll help collect the medical records. They'll work with um, the applicant, you know, when it's adult or a family, when it's a child to um, identify the sources of that information, get all the information needed for the claim and um, be that kind of central point of contact and keep that application moving. So it's done in partnership, um, but also, you know, on behalf in some instances, right? So helping take, um, you know, not ownership over the process because it definitely belongs to um, the applicant and the family, but, you know, in kind of coordinating that effort and organizing it for sure. That's how we um, train to do it. And that's why it takes so much effort that it's not just about answering questions or telling them where to go or that you might be eligible to eligible, here's the website, apply or call SSA, you know, it's really about actively doing kind of every piece of that puzzle. And so the SOAR online course walks the caseworker through how all of that works, each form that's required, each piece of information you need to gather, how to complete that, how to complete that in conjunction with the, the applicant with the family member. Awesome. Thank you so much for that clarification. You're welcome. Yeah. All right. So uh, in the chat box, uh, Karen asked, do SOAR providers also help with reassessment? And is it a good idea for families to reach out before they complete the reassessment paperwork? Yeah, absolutely. So um, some do. Every provider is different, right? So what, you know, SOAR is a, a model. We have a training and we have support for how to implement the model. Um, but each agency is doing work and has different expertise, you know, based on um, how they're operating, I guess I could say. Um, and so many will help with this reassessment or kind of maintenance of benefits, because once you get someone approved for benefits, you definitely want to help them to maintain them along the way. So we do have, um, we have some resources on our website specific to that about, you know, what to do and to help, you know, current beneficiaries um, maintain their benefits. So, um, yeah. Great question. Um, Paula asked, is this a free service for families? Um, so I would say in 99% of the case, absolutely yes. And it is what we ask of all SOAR providers. If you say you're providing SOAR services, that you are not charging um, the individual or the family for that service, that it's just whatever services you're providing as your agency and how they are um, interacting with you. So it's unlike um, some of the models that perhaps attorneys and other non-attorney social security representatives are that you may see like advertising on billboards or TV. It's not like that, taking a percentage of someone's back payment or charging them for assisting with the application. That We know that the individuals that we're targeting and wanna serve with SOAR um, need every single penny of their back payment and don't have you know, resources to, to pay for that application support. And so that's why a big piece of what we do at the SOAR TA Center is to help organizations identify sources of funding so that they can pay their caseworkers or their staff to be able to assist with claims without charging um, the individual directly. Great question. Anyone else? And Millie, if you see hands raised, I don't think I can see all. All right. Um, so Alberto asked in the chat, is this service only available to families experiencing homelessness or at risk of becoming homeless? So yes, that is the target population for SOAR, but I have a little asterisk on that. So one, the definition of at risk of homelessness that we use for SOAR is incredibly broad. So if you have a family who doesn't have income, has someone who has a disability, um, they are going to be at risk of homelessness, even if they have you know, a voucher paying for their rent at the time, right? Because if you don't have a stable income, you are at risk of losing that voucher, you're at risk of losing that housing. And so that uh, risk category is incredibly broad for us. We know that there are lots of different definitions of homelessness and ours is one that is all inclusive, right? Um, that we want to prevent homelessness. And so the at-risk piece is very, um, is very broad. 
The other thing I would say is let's say you did have someone who was fully stably housed, everything is good, they have resources, but they also need you know, to apply for disability benefits. The SOAR model of how to submit a good quality application can be applied to any social security application, right? Um, but it's just whether you call it SOAR or you track it in the SOAR um, outcomes database or you tell social security this is a SOAR um, assisted application would need to fit that other definition, that definition of homeless or at risk, if that makes sense. So we know like this is just good free information. It's out there to improve any social security application. And it's just a question of whether we track it as a SOAR assisted claim for that um, specific population, which again is incredibly broad. And I will drop the, um, we have a, a document on our definitions of homelessness. And I will drop that link in the chat right here. So you can check that out, see how broad and inclusive it is. Um, all right, so Isamar asked, uh, for those denied back in the beginning of the pandemic 2019, can they appeal with SOAR? So yes, a lot of SOAR providers help with the um, reconsideration and ALJ hearing level of appeal. So it just depends on the provider. And we have tools and resources on our website about the appeals process and what goes into that. Um, so the reconsideration level is really similar to the initial application. The ALJ hearing level is a little more complicated. So we have additional kind of resources on that specifically. And um, we have a really great uh, toolkit that I wanna, um, I'll add the link to yeah. that. Yeah, back then she was denied because uh, it was contradicting with SSDI and survivor benefits. So I, I, I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah, and it could be, you know, um, sometimes with SSI, um, because it's a needs based program, if someone is eligible for other benefits, they have other income coming in that puts them over the limit for SSI, they might be ineligible for non-medical reasons, just because the income and resource limits are very low um, for SSI. But there's the, the link to the appeals packet. Um, all right, so uh, Brianna asked, uh, do they help young fathers and mothers that are in need of housing? So some organizations that are using SOAR are um, homeless service providers or housing providers that help make that connection and others will utilize their um, kind of community collaborations and connections um, to help make those referrals or connections to housing. So not all um, SOAR providers are also housing providers, um, but we, we try to make sure that people are looking at you know, all of the needs of an individual. So if we're helping someone to gain income so that they're able to pay at least part of their rent, we want to make sure that they also have, you know, connections to housing providers or rental assistance programs or voucher programs where they can kind of fill in the gaps. Because uh, we know that that $841 a month is uh, not enough uh, to make ends meet. So. Good question. Christian, this is Millie. I, I have a question. Yeah. Um, so what would you say for those that um, are, are here on the webinar today that help youth and families um, in lots of other, lots of different situations? And I would guess that um, they, are, they also have an advocacy hat that they put on. Um, what value would be um, for them in taking the Soar for Children course or even the other one in, in their daily work um, when yeah. you're trying to connect with supports and services, I could see it would be helpful. What yeah. value do you see in that? Yeah, so I mean, I think there's so much value in um, helping people get and kind of maximize their income. So if you, you know, have a family that maybe is only able to work part time or not able to work enough, or they have a child with disabilities that's, um, you know, takes extra resources and care and time um, that having that extra income based on that child's disability could really make a difference in the family's life. And so understanding um, that eligibility and knowing that that could be a possible possibility, excuse me, even for a family that may have, you know, a parent that's able to work um, 
or you know work at, at different levels, but maybe not you know over those income and resource limits for SSI. Um, and so this can kind of make those ends meet. Um, so I'd say, you know, understanding that process, the eligibility and learning that through the SOAR online course um, can make a huge difference. Um, and I would say, you know, a, a nice starting point is looking at these, the child um, SSI uh, info sheets that I mentioned in the presentation. This is the direct link to them. And, you know, sharing them with the relevant providers in your community or the one that is, you know, your, your provider or represents it and talking to your colleagues um, or, you know, program staff and say, is this something that we can do? Is this something that we can add to the services that we offer so that we can make sure that anyone that, you know, comes into our program who may be eligible can get this support and we can provide that support for them. Um, and if, you know, by chance you're, you know, at a, um, provider that's eligible for Medicaid reimbursement um, and you can help to make sure that your you know family and child has um, access to Medicaid you're getting reimbursed for all of that care um, any retroactive reimbursement that may be available um, is also a great kind of motivator on a an agency level in terms of adopting um, a new program thank you yeah any other questions folks have? Beverly has her hand up. Oh yeah, please go ahead. Thanks. Hey Beverly. Hi, um, I have a question about uh, transitioning. Um, for parents or caregivers that are trying to help um, transition their kids to their own homes um, mm -hmm. with the SSI, SSDI, um, how, do they help, how do they help them to switch over when they become adults? Because I know sometimes when they become adults, um, you have to um, get, become a guardian or a legal guardian of that um, young adult in order to help them with the paperwork. Yeah, so um, SSA has really specific requirements about um, who is able to apply on behalf of the child or once they become an adult, that adult. Um, and they don't recognize all um, forms of guardianship. So I'll just put a little asterisk there about um, kind of investigating a, a look into that a little bit more. But I think the most important piece is, you know, aside from, you know, who might be signing the application or helping to initiate it, um, that's, you know, something that can definitely be addressed. But the most important piece is doing that age 18 redetermination. Um, so I'm going to put the link in the chat for our article and information about that piece in particular. Um, but what happens a lot of times when a, a child turns age 18 who was receiving SSI benefits as a child, um, that they uh, get cut off basically is what happens. If you aren't able to produce the medical evidence or respond to the inquiries about that redetermination and show that the, the now adult is um, meets the adult criteria for SSI, a lot of times we see people's uh, benefits stop at that transition. So getting ahead of the game, getting ready with all of the medical records you can, documentation you can to show um, that the, the young adult is uh, eligible is really important and to follow through with that process. And it can start uh, when the child is 17. Um, so you can start getting things together and then 30 days before they turn 18, you can have everything submitted and if they're in foster care, it's like I said, 180 days prior. Um, and so there's just some information there about that redetermination. Um, there's a lot of considerations for both children and young adults and, and you know, other adults in terms of representative payees and who helps to manage the funds um, for that individual. And so that's kind of another consideration there, whether, um, the now young adult uh, will manage their own funds, whether they'll get help from a parent or another representative payee or other caregiver um, or, and work towards managing their own funds hopefully someday in the future. So all of those things uh, you know, come into play too. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. 
All right, so Brianna asked in the chat, how do we help young adults that are trying to get their own place still on their parents' housing lease, um, knowing that's hard? Um, so <clears throat> I think in terms of the, the social security angle on this, this actually can make a difference in eligibility. Um, so when you look at uh, a child's eligibility, you're looking at the child's income and resources and the family's. And so if you're living in the family household, your living arrangement is considered that you're receiving this in-kind support and maintenance. And so if a um, young adult moves out on their own, they have their own living arrangement, their own rent um, responsibilities, it kind of changes the picture in terms of whether they may now be eligible um, based on their own individual income and resources outside of that family household. Um, so I can, I can speak to, <laughs> to that end of it, of like how social security's regulations and eligibility impact those two different households and how there's definitely a benefit to the young adult to be in their own to increase their chances of eligibility. In terms of the you know strategies of support, I think there are um, other experts out there to kind of help with that too, because that is definitely hard, uh, like you said. Good question. Any other questions coming in? You're welcome. Feel free to raise your hand. If you have a question, you can unmute. Anybody on a call have ideas about what might be your next step? Any ideas that you have? I know I'm going to be looking at the directory for sure. Great, that's great. There's our website email again. I don't know, Billy, you, you have can, any wrap up that you wanted to do? Yeah, you can keep um, sharing that slide right there. That's great. Okay. Um, I, I did want to say that, um, you know, we, I'm, I'm making an assumption about everyone who is on the call, um, but we're all in the helping services. Um, you know, we, we want people to succeed. And a lot of times that means that we're connecting them with different things and we're helping them navigate systems that are really complicated and they don't speak to each other. Um, and so this is just one of those systems that we could possibly help youth and families navigate by learning more ourselves. And so I very much appreciate, um, you know, you being here to talk about SOAR and to answer some of the questions about um, Social Security, because it is a very complex system um, and it can be difficult to understand that. I know having seen the SOAR materials um, and particularly the child curriculum, um, I, I appreciate that it does walk step by step and is very clear about the paperwork um, and, and what is needed. So it's just another tool um, for people to have in their tool belts to help youth and families when they are in need. Um, so I just wanted to point that out. I appreciate everyone being here today and thank you so much, Kristen, for sharing um, your expertise in this area. Um, you provided a lot of resources um, I know this is being recorded, and so this and the resources, including the slides, will be available on the INTAC website. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure, Joanne, does everyone who registered get an email with a link to that? Um, everybody who registered in the reminder email um, was given information about accessing recordings um, okay. on the site, and then anybody who attended will get a follow-up email. Uh, with a copy of the slide deck and then also the same uh, link to the intact recordings. Okay, there's a number of links in the chat that um, that Kristen put in there. I can pull those out and get those to you too, um, Joanne. Um, so okay. if, if everyone also would remember that we do have an evaluation and it's very helpful to get your feedback on the information that is shared through intact you know, let us know what's working for you, um, other areas that you'd like to hear about or receive some training on. Um, it only helps us do better for you so that you can do better for youth and families. Um, so that is uh, the end of our webinar today. And uh, again, we thank you for participating. 
and look forward to seeing you in a future event.